Today's episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSense, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free trial at www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co slash PMC. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. Do me a quick favor. If you like what you hear at Planet Microcap, please take two seconds and give us five stars on Spotify or Apple. This helps with the search engines so that more folks can also discover and engage with all things microcap stocks. Our next investor conference is coming up. The Planet Microcap Showcase Vancouver is on September 6 and 7, 2023 at the Fairmont Waterfront in Vancouver, BC. We have announced initial presenting companies, sponsors, and speakers. Some of those speakers include Dave Barr from Pender Fund, Harold Leishman and Brent Todd from Canaccord Genuity, Ryan Irvin from Keystone Financial, Hamed Shabazi from Well Health Technologies, and Paul Andriola from Small Cap Discoveries. Be sure to check out the website to learn more and to register and attend. Please go to planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vancouver. My guest on the show today is Josh Young, founder and portfolio manager at Bison Interests. I've had Josh on the show twice before. The last time was July 2022, and it was definitely time to get a high-level update on all things energy and oil and gas, and specifically, why it's gone off the radar. We discuss how the global energy crisis has been temporarily diffused, valuations collapsed, tech stocks reinflated, and what the opportunity set looks like in oil and gas on the small cap side. Josh also goes into detail on a few ideas within the oil and gas opportunity set that he's looking at, Vital Energy, Journey Energy, and Sandridge. Thank you again for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Josh Young. Josh, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are you? Well, you know, just I think we're kind of recovered from, you know, a little holiday weekend here, but enough about that. We're going to hit them hard right at the get-go. When it comes to, uh, you know, look, you're my guy, anything, energy, oil and gas, you know, we haven't really done anything covering that sector specifically in a while and um, figured we get that update. So from a high level, let, let's start right there. You know, in your opinion, what's going on in oil and gas and why do you think it's maybe gone off the radar a little bit? Yeah, I think it's been <laughs> it's been remarkable how interested people were, let's say, starting 18 months ago and how uninterested they are right now, as well as, let's say, five years ago, seven years ago, whatever. So it's back to normal for me. Um, so I'd say that uh, the biggest thing that's happened is that this global energy crisis has been at least temporarily diffused, right? Europe has enough uh, energy. Asia has enough energy, at least for now. Uh, natural gas prices in Europe crashed from their uh, sort of scary highs around this time last year. And so as the energy crisis has come down and as oil prices uh, came down along with it, um, you know, I think people just lost interest. Valuations have started to collapse, especially on the smaller caps. Uh, fund flows are sort of moving away. And then the other really big thing is just that as tech stocks have reinflated and the overall market rose while energy stocks were falling, it just sort of, I think it took away whatever that sort of initial interest was uh, in the space. And I think people sort of reverted to the pattern that they had sort of developed over the last decade, which is this is not interesting. It's a place that people lose money in. And so I think we've just seen sort of a combination of money and attention uh, flow away from oil and gas. Well, let's let's sit on that first point you said, you know, having to do with the global energy crisis, having been temporarily diffused. And, you know, like we talked about that 18 months ago, how like, hey, this is going to be a problem. And it's not. And look, you, I'm not trying to call you out or anything and say like you were like, uh, you know, 
trying to hit the, the you know what is it doom porn i love that that phrase like uh you know trying to hit that button or anything like that but i mean wasn't it also somewhat expected and i'm sure you thought about it of like all right maybe this is getting a little out of hand this you know not that this crisis wasn't real but the panic around it might be a little overinflated you know how did I, even going back to that time like how did you think about it and then how do you think about it today yeah it's funny i feel like um even sort of when it was all over the news, uh, the financial media was looking for people that were going to go out and say the world is ending. And so, you know, I, I, I've been on CNBC, I think all of twice in my career. And one of them was CNBC International. And they asked me about it. I think it was in September of 2021, right as European natural gas prices were starting to rise. And they were like, hey, what's going to happen? And they were talking about how European gas prices were likely to fall. And I said, look, unfortunately, that's unlikely. But what is likely is that it's going to be variable and you know, there's going to be a lot of volatility. And eventually you're probably going to see that price fall. So, you know, what they wanted was people to either say, oh, it's going to be fine or the world is ending. And there's not really a lot of room for complexity in all this. And then, you know, I think the the really interesting thing has been that no one from a when you look at just any of the different media or anything that really has gotten traction, no one talks about the really interesting thing, which is part of why I was so excited to come back and, and talk with you, which is that when you're in a space that people hate and when money is fleeing a space, there are incredible investment opportunities. And the, the variance in between people's level of interest in a space and the ability to outperform both the specific space benchmarks as well as sort of the overall market is tremendous. So there's just this enormous opportunity. Um, and the less popular it is and the more the oil price sort of lags or is stagnant and the more that people aren't interested in a potential energy crisis or whatever, <laughs> the more room there is for a public market investor to generate a positive return, both relative to the space as well as relative to the overall market so i mean look you, you mentioned how you were on cnbc and they were kind of asking that and there's not really i mean look dude that, that's you only got five minutes to make your point right like what are you going to do like uh, how do you get into something as complex as you know the entire energy ecosystem globally uh and distill that into five minutes that's pretty good that's why we have us you know we were able to kind of dive in a little bit deeper but a couple other points that i also wanted to hit on that you mentioned having to do with you know this high level update you know why oil and gas has gone off the radar you mentioned valuations collapse which we'll get into in a second because that ties into some other things but you also talked about how tech stocks have been reinflated i mean why are these the same are same investors that are now like hey we were embracing the energy boom are, these are the same ones that are now just kind of going away from that and now looking at tech and saying, okay, there might be, you know, more interesting opportunities here and energy is back to where it used to be. Uh, I mean, that's a great question. And I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, I think like the closest that people, the people that would know the best, I guess, are market makers. So, you know, the um, the uh, market making firms, as well as some of the investment banks and prime brokers would sort of know who specifically is holding these things. I think it the, the price setting is always on the margin in a market. So it's where is sort of the hot money going in terms of setting higher prices or lower prices, because it's sort of the incremental buyer or seller. And then I think to some extent, there's uh, some factor rotation where you essentially see a lot of the quant fund funds and CTAs and other sort of, it's not really hot money as much as just sort of momentum and price-driven investing where, um, you know, there's been this inverse correlation between tech stocks and oil and gas stocks for almost a decade now. And so, um, you know, I think there's sort of this tendency to revert back to trends that we're holding, even if they, I mean, I actually don't know that I disagree with that trend. I just think that, you know, when there's enough companies trading at 10 times revenue or more, you want to just sell those and, you know, buy the things at a 10th of revenue. And, you know, obviously there's many different metrics and none of this is a recommendation to do anything, but, you know, my tendency is definitely to sort of run that other direction. So I don't know that they're necessarily wrong. I just don't think it's very likely that, let's say, five years from now, buying a bunch of tech stocks at 10 or 20 times revenue um, is the right way to go while shorting oil companies at two times operating cash flow. Absolutely. So one more question when looking at the macro and just like point blank, you know, looking at this, you know, other than just the global energy crisis kind of temporarily being diffused. And I think that's interesting is the idea of this temporarily. I mean, do you expect there to be some other issues that 
won't be temporary that are coming up that might now see a little bit even more volatility one way or the other for the energy space? Yeah. So there, there were sort of a few things that happened all at once that I think surprised everyone, partly because they were sort of contrary to sort of the general uh, media narrative and general understanding of how things work, as well as because they just happened at the same time. So you saw Russia sort of uh, Russia cutting off supplies of natural gas to Europe um, at the same time as you saw some of the underinvestment in sort of global oil and gas production kick in at the same time as you started to see some of the false narrative around renewables um, show up where, you know, there had been this and there's been this uh rapid, almost exponential growth in renewable uh, power generation deployment. Um, but the reality is that renewable generation is unreliable. And so you sort of had this, this building issue, which was you could really easily supply, let's say, a tenth of 1% of the grid with solar or wind and no problem, right? Because it's just so small. But as you started to cut into some of the base load, you were introducing reliability issues and other sort of structural issues. And so you were increasing the inherent instability of both the power grid and sort of the energy supply. And as you combine that with a sort of big event like Russia cutting off gas supplies and with sort of this building underinvestment and um, insufficient supply in the global sort of oil and gas um, supply chain, or I guess the supply uh, set, um, you, you add this combination of things all happen at once. The problem is that two of those three things sort of didn't go away, right? There's still this unreliability issue and real challenge in terms of uh, storage of intermittent power sources uh, like solar and wind. What do you do when the sun's not shining or the wind isn't blowing or both, um, or when it's really hot and that reduces solar uh, effectiveness and utilization, or when it's really cold and you end up with wind blowing, but the wind uh, turbines are, are stuck because they're frozen or they have a lot of snow accumulation. So um, there, there's sort of structural problems with some of the, the things we've been doing globally in terms of the um, energy sort of uh, the energy. It's not really the supply chain, but sort of the, the set of energy production. Um, and that sort of coincided with a couple other things. So, yeah, Russia is supplying more natural gas than uh, people expected. And really, Russia is supplying way more oil and condensate than people expected, which is really why oil prices are a lot lower than they were a year ago, 18 months ago. Um, so so that supply wasn't, it was threatened, but it wasn't really as much of an issue as people thought a year ago. But you have these same problems, the same underlying problems besides that one shock. And so I think it sets up for more volatility and the risk of another um, crisis or arguably sort of a continuation of the recent crisis. And, you know, it's hard to predict exactly when that will kick in. And just really importantly, I think that's really similar to the 1970s. There's lots of differences, but the similarity is that you had this sort of instability in the global oil uh, supply then around the formation of OPEC and around certain uh, geopolitical actions. And I, I'd argue that's sort of similar, weirdly, to the underinvestment in oil and gas now, as well as the um, increasing reliance on unreliable intermittent power sources. So with my next question, I, I hope not to disembowel, I don't know if that's the right word, everything that you just said, but it's something that, you know, even for folks like me, like I'm a generalist, I'm looking at everything, you know, I don't have as much, you know, I'm not in ONG as, as much as, you know, as you or, you know, some of, some of your colleagues, how much should a generalist, you know, whether it's a micro cap, small cap, you know, just everyday investor, how much should they really focus on some of these narratives? That you've said, because as you as we've kind of alluded to, it can change pretty quickly, right? So, you know, Josh, love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think most people should just put money with um, managers who outperform over time or in index funds and not spend time on any of this stuff, whether it's, um, you know, the the hot trend of the day or whether it's sort of these longer term themes. So the reality is most people spend too much time on this stuff and shouldn't. And then the people that should spend time on it, I would argue, are spending too much time on things that are more ephemeral. And I think these energy issues are actually becoming bigger and bigger. And there is a trajectory where the I think 
Um, it's not just that they're increasing it as a problem, they're also increasingly volatile, which means it's even more valuable, I think, to invest the time in understanding them. So I would argue that they've been less relevant for a while, especially as oil and gas stocks underperformed as energy went from, I think it was uh, almost 30% of the overall market uh, like 30 or 40 years ago. I think the early 80s, that was sort of the peak and it was uh, close to 30% of the S&P 500 was energy. And right now it's close to 4%, especially on the when you look at oil and gas producers, it's even maybe 2% two, 2 or so if you exclude a couple of the, the super majors. So um, I think it's gotten to the point where it's very interesting, partly because of the challenges in the uh, global supply, uh, both because of intermittency as well as because of underinvestment. And then that sort of starts you out along with really low valuations for uh, likely, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, sort of super volatility. So let's transition to that. You know, as we said, you know, I, I've, I've been setting you up for it. You know, as you mentioned, you know, um, when we're talking about the high level, what's going on and why it's gone off the radar as a result, you know, we've seen um, or as, as you, you've alluded to, a lot of uh, valuations uh, collapsed. Um, and that also sets up, you know, potential opportunities to look at quality, potential quality ideas in the space because there is so much. I don't know, so much hatred or is it just lack of caring of OG or energy in general. So, you know, love to get your opinion on, you know, maybe a bit further why valuations specifically have collapsed. And then what are some of the things you're looking for amongst the quote unquote rubble? Yeah. So, so I think when you saw people get excited about this energy crisis, you saw people get excited about oil prices surging way over a hundred dollars a barrel. You saw a lot of money come in and sort of bid up almost everything. You still didn't really see the small caps get bid up too much in terms of uh, valuations. And when I look back at, Hey, should I have sold more, you know, selling companies at two times or three times their likely mid-cycle operating cash flow just isn't that exciting for me. It's not where you've wanted to sell in past cycles. And even if you were a really sort of sophisticated, great market timer, that wasn't really, it wasn't really what you'd be looking for as a, as a sell signal. But many people, as it sort of came off their radar, as oil prices started to fall last year and have basically been in a downtrend um, essentially since this time last year. Um, I think there was just a lot of hot money that came in, whether it was into the overall sort of ETFs or whether it was into sort of specific names on specific theses that have come out that have sold uh, a lot of redemptions from funds, a lot of private equity funds that have sold more of their companies, gotten stock or cash and distributed that back without redeploying it into the sector. So I think, I think it's just sort of been this general washout. And then where there hasn't been as much of a washout has been on the large caps, where the combination, I think, of uh, Berkshire Hathaway, you know, Warren Buffett going and buying larger and larger stakes in Occidental Petroleum in particular, um, as well as just the, the outperformance of large caps in general in the market versus small caps and micro caps, where there's been just money flooding into these uh, larger index funds and ETFs focused on uh, the, the largest companies, as well as I think people still appreciate the dividends that some of these large cap energy companies are paying. And so they're, they're, these companies like Exxon and Chevron are fitting in a number of different portfolios and allocations that are receiving money, whereas some of the smaller cap names, and I understand this is probably true to some extent across the small and micro cap space, but I think it's particularly true for energy. Um, you're just not seeing those same sort of fund flows. And when you see funds going towards energy, they're almost exclusively going into these large cap names, which is really starving a sector that is capital intensive. And I think I think that's really where this set of opportunities is, is opening up. And then when there isn't that money flowing in, when there's sort of this net money flowing out from a sector, especially from sort of the smaller names in a sector, you end up with very big mispricings as well as just opportunities where you show them to people and they say, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> Tell me what I'm missing. Tell me what's wrong with this. And, you know, in many cases, it's just, there's no incremental buyer of the stock today. There might be tomorrow. And generally that's one of the things I'm looking for are things that are improving, or there's some reason why they're going to get bid by the market other than just money coming into the space. But I think that's really the, I think it's the puzzle. And I think it's really hard 
it's really hard for sort of family offices and for small allocators to funds that I think they just don't understand this. And then individual investors, I think to some extent are tapped out and to some extent they're burnt out and actually actively selling oil and gas stocks rather than sort of shopping for these opportunities and, and putting money into them. Right. And listen, in some respects, you don't blame some of those, you know, some of those buy side and family offices. like, all right, I know I got to get some exposure here. Like, I guess it's easier just to put it in the ones that I know are, you know, throwing off a dividend, you know, get, I know it's safe here. I don't have to worry about it. I know oil and gas isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Like it's, so that's like kind of the easier move at the same time, but where the real money is made obviously is looking at some of these ones that are okay. Going where everything is hated. You know, you mentioned how there are certain situations you've seen where you've shown it to some people and they're like, this is like what's going on. This is confusing. So I, listen, I'm not listen, I'm not as good as Andrew and getting into it on a, a certain idea and everything like that. I'll leave that for Andrew and I'm sure you'll go back on his pod at some point soon. You know, but I mean, are there any examples of some of these companies that you've seen that you've shown people and they're like, are you serious right now? Um, I don't understand why it's trading at where it is. Yeah. So, so first of all, just to, to set the table. So we, uh, we're able to talk about our performance now, which is an exciting change. And so just to highlight sort of what the opportunity is in a space that people hate that they're withdrawing capital from. So I was just looking through our historical performance. And again, this isn't an offer or a solicitation or anything like that, but it is helpful, I think, in terms of understanding what the opportunity set may be and to sort of frame why it might make sense to spend the time on these sort of individual um, individual investment ideas. So Bison, since we launched a little more than eight years ago, is up over 100% net. And the relevant benchmark is the S&P 600 uh, small cap energy index, essentially, you know, $5 billion and lower market cap energy stocks. Those are down about 70%. And the investable ETF PSCE is down about 70% to net of, uh, you know, the expenses associated with investment in that. Um, the large cap ETF, which again has experienced enormous fund flows and is the beneficiary of a lot of these different factors, is up very slightly. I'm, I'm going off of memory. I think it's up about 10% since that sort of May 2015 timeframe. And the overall market is up. Uh, I have to go back and look at the exact numbers, but I think it's up around what Bison is up, even though you know we're invested in these things that are down about 70% in aggregate since inception. So there's really room to materially outperform the sector and even the overall market by finding specific small cap and micro cap opportunities that are grossly mispriced that have, you know, many different factors that that combine. So, you know, I know this is this is your world and, and some of your your viewers' worlds. And I think it's just helpful to, you know, step back sometimes, look at performance over many years, think about sort of what these things mean while you're <laughs> sort of suffering and you know, I'll tweet out these different sort of jokes around uh what's it like investing in oil stocks and it's a ferris wheel uh, and people say oh it's not so bad oh, well it's on fire um so you know it can feel really tough and monthly performance and daily performance and even yearly performance can sometimes be really rough but in aggregate over time there's just so much opportunity and i think it's helpful to put numbers to that to be able to frame hey this isn't crazy and it's just as unpopular now as it was, I mean, roughly as unpopular as it was eight years ago. And here you are, even with that period of pretty intense unpopularity and fund outflows, there's room to just materially outperform. And so again, I think it's just, I think it's helpful to, to frame that, to understand and to validate this thesis that there are these great opportunities and that it is possible to outperform, especially when people really hate something. Absolutely. All right. So let, let's get into some of those opportunities you're seeing. I mean, I, I remember, I think the last time we had you on, you were looking at like, I think it was Journey Energy, right? You're, yeah. So you're, let's you're, talk yeah. about three. We'll talk about okay. Journey Energy. We'll talk about Vital Energy, which I think I want to talk about first. And then we can talk <laughs> about Sandwich. Okay. And so, so Vital is interesting. I, I put out something very recently on this where they're actually a AI beneficiary. And so you talk about like the buzzword of the, the moment, right? People with uh, the enormous popularity of chat GPT a few months ago, 
um, started to talk a lot more about uh, AI focused companies. And you, know, you had NVIDIA give this enormous guidance based on their expectation of additional chips that were going to get bought for, um, for all these different companies rolling out AI type solutions. And you saw stocks of companies that had nothing to do with AI, that had nothing, you know, they were, you know, it's like the equivalent of Long Island iced tea that turned into Long Island blockchain or whatever, where their stocks went nuts. So Vital um, is a acquire and exploit oil company. They go and buy oil and gas fields, particularly focused on West Texas, and they improve the operations on those fields. And they're an ultra low valuation company that that's hated for a number of reasons. Their margins are a little lower because they tend to buy older, sort of uh, less sexy fields, and they improve them across a variety of different metrics. And one of the things they've been doing for a few years now is using machine learning and AI to, to optimize their field operations. And the idea is to emit less uh, methane into the atmosphere to, to be able to track and, and control emissions, as well as to improve their uptime and various other sort of operating metrics. And they developed in for some of this their own uh, internal tech, and some of it they're implementing third-party solutions. And so, you know, this is probably the the last thing people would have expected that an oil and gas investor would talk about, but they're doing it. And unlike most of the companies that are talking about AI, where there's a lot of hand waving and no numbers, they have very specific numbers that they've shared where they're attributing certain specific improvements in operating and financial performance to this sort of buzzword of the moment, right? And it's real and they've been doing it since way before it was popular and no one cares. People actually hate that they're doing it. There are many people that say, oh, like they, it can't be that they're doing this or it's like they're lying or it's wrong. It's like, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I've been talking with them about it for a long time and it's just, you know, this has been something that they've talked about that they've gotten flack for doing for a while. So, you know, it's real because they've been doing it since way before it was sexy or popular or whatever. Um, and people don't care. And I think they're actually probably selling the stock because they saw it in this company's presentation, even though it's been in there in different forms for a number of years. So that's, I, I like that because people just hate this so much that you take the thing that they're paying crazy valuations for, for companies that are not beneficiaries at all from it, or that trade at such high valuations that, you know, even if they were really big beneficiaries, you're unlikely as a shareholder buying stock or holding stock today to benefit at all. And here's this company where you know they trade at such a low valuation that any improvement in their margins dramatically improves the the forecast for the company. And it you know if an argument is hey they don't generate enough free cash flow, well you know if they're producing two percent or three percent more, and if they're losing fifteen percent less of you know one metric and they're making five percent more, well if your problem is low margins, here's higher margins from this thing. If your problem is less growth, here's growth from this thing, and then. I think it should also get people a little more comfortable with their additional acquisitions as well as with their operating performance generally. So it's sort of one of these weird things where you can use something like this as a sentiment test as well as an opportunity, like if you want to benefit from the implementation of AI in sort of boring old world type companies rather than chip manufacturers or software providers that may or may not actually realize benefits. I mean, here's a company that is an actual, you know, their, their financials and their operations are improving because of this technology trend and people hate it. And so it's just so wonderful to get to buy something like that, to see the sentiment around it. And, you know, I wasn't thinking that people would go and buy this stock because of this thing, but it's pretty cool to be able to get this. And um, I think I have the book up here. I don't know if you can see it, but um, it's uh, uh, Fooling Some of the People All the Time by uh, David Einhorn. And if you look at his at the early part of that book, he talks about his early performance for Greenlight. And as I recall, one of the best performers right at the start of his fund was a company that ended up being a dot-com beneficiary. And he didn't own it for that. He owned it for, you know, the, it was a value stock that was just sort of a normal business at a very discounted price. And I think his fund was up something like 100% one year, just <laughs> essentially from this one thing, just going crazy. And so, you know, my my take on these sorts of stocks is if you can find something where they have and and I don't expect Vital to double because of their implementation of AI, right? Frankly, like it's nice, it's helpful for their business, but 
I think it's just so interesting to be able to own something purely from a deep value and underwriting the specifics of the company and the assets and its cash flows and its likely future cash flows and be able to get something like, you know, improved metrics from AI for free or even, you know, for cheaper than free. So um, I thought I thought you might find that, that interesting. Maybe Listen, I'm interested. just I'm just ho- I'm glad that they didn't change their name, at least to vital AI energy, as long as they, you know. That 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 that's 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 good. I'm glad they didn't go the Long Island uh, blockchain route. Um, <laughs> but you said you also wanted to talk a little bit about Journey Energy and Sandwich. So let's get that in. Yeah. So um, so Journey, similar idea, right? So I like these companies that have sort of core businesses that are heavily discounted. By the way, you are a shareholder in Vital Journey oh, yes. and Sandwich. I'm a, I'm a shareholder in all three of these. I'm not recommending them. The the idea is to illustrate potential opportunities in small cap publicly traded oil and gas stocks, as well as where some of the performance has come from. And I think it's just, I think people find these things interesting and they're they're really helpful to 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 think about, to study. And you know, frankly, I don't care if people buy these stocks or not. And if anything, the the feedback I get where, oh, I hate this for this reason, right? This is a bad that how could you talk about AI with an oil company? It's like, okay, well, who do you think is going to use AI, right? Do you think it's going to be just high tech software companies, or do you think it's going to be real world manufacturers, real world operators? And if something is purely just software oriented, that's wonderful. But where software doesn't touch the real world, in many cases, it fails or it doesn't truly monetize or what have you. And so I think it's really, it's one of these wonderful things where the less people like some of these things, the more I like it. Um, So journey, similar idea, low decline oil and gas producer in Canada. um, And they're also ramping up their natural gas based power generation. And this was something that I sort of twisted their arms to look at a number of years ago, and they eventually did it and have been doing it and ramping so well that it's way beyond what my expectations were at the time. Uh, Alberta is a sort of extreme case of uh, reliance on unreliable power sources where they're ramping aggressively their solar and wind power, which is leading to enormously high local uh, power prices as they shut off their coal power plants, as they roll out additional solar and wind. And frankly, it's <laughs> it's north, right? So it's not a great idea to build a lot of solar in a place where you're not getting, I mean, they actually get a decent amount of sun, but you're not getting the same. I mean, if it's covered with snow, if you're you know getting a lot of cloudy days or a lot of other issues and, and similar similar challenge with wind. It's just not, you want wind in West Texas uh, or North Texas on you know the hills where you get just tons of, of wind. You don't really want it further North where you can have other sort of weather issues. Um, so it's a bad spot for alternatives. Canada is pushing it aggressively. They're pushing enormously high CO2 taxes, which is pushing coal power out of business. And what's happening is that the best spot to be in is where Journey is developing, which is a uh, natural gas power gen, which can turn off for the five or six hours a day that solar is generating sort of its peak power or where there's a combination of solar and wind generation. So the ability to be intermittent, similar to um, similar to solar and wind, but to sort of produce when those aren't um, is very valuable. And there's very little power that's built into the grid in Alberta, frankly, in many other places, but in Alberta in particular, there's not a lot that's built like this. And so they have um, their power gen business that they're ramping, they have very little cash flow from it today. They're going from four megawatts to 35 megawatts by they expect the first quarter of next year. And their cost basis on it is a fraction of what their competitors have been able to deliver, uh, partly because they go and buy used parts and refurbish them. And they've had a lot of success with their initial thing. And they're you know about to show at a much larger scale that it's working. And so for me, it's really exciting because they're taking their natural gas and instead of selling it for $2 in MCF in the local market um, and then having to pay essentially a dollar for processing and transport and all the other issues that make it almost zero profit, they're essentially going to be able to sell it for $10 or $15 in MCF by putting it through power gen. And they're not actually paying that much for the power generation equipment and installation. It's just a big headache. And so they're translating their effort and their willingness to go through years of regulatory headaches and jumping through many, many hoops 
into a huge amount of extra cash flow from their sort of base business. So um, you essentially buy this low decline production and get the power gen for free. And in the sort of traditional value investor framework of good co, bad co, you basically, <laughs> it's sort of weird for me to say this because I focus on oil and gas producers, but the oil and gas production is the bad co. And again, it's a great business. They're really good at it. And it's probably worth more than what they're trading for. Um, but the good co is this triple digit growth rate power generation business that's built to purpose for the undersupplied Alberta power grid, which is likely to stay undersupplied at least for the hours that Journey is planning to supply their power into as intermittent power to make up for uh, the unreliability of solar and wind. Um, and so you get that essentially for free, but that's the good co, right? That business could end up being worth many times what they're trading for. It's growing at triple digits and it's just sitting there. And I think I think it's one of those things where, especially with smaller microcaps, people are looking for dividends, they're looking for buybacks, they're looking for um, results that are already in the financials. And there's some benefit to be able to underwrite something like this, understand it very well, have been involved in the Alberta grid a number of years ago when I was chairman of a company in the in the sector uh, producing power at that time and understanding, hey, like this is where this is where things are going. This is going to generate a huge amount of cash flow. There's enormous returns on invested capital for this company from deploying it. And it's not that much in the financials right now. If anything, they're actually net a consumer of power at really high prices until they get this additional uh, 31 megawatts online. And so they're going to flip from getting punished for high local power prices to materially cashing in on this. And I think it just changes the whole complexion of their business. And you know, it's pretty, pretty exciting and sort of this weird situation where you know, I definitely wouldn't ever have expected to call an oil producer that's low decline with lots of reserves and a lot of success in that business, the bad co for an investment that I'm invested in. All right. All right. So um, listen, I, I'm going to let everybody else go out and continue to do their own due diligence after hearing everything that, that you're saying here today, starting with Vital Energy, now Journey Energy. You mentioned one more sandwich. So take the floor on that one too. Yeah. So, so I think when we first talked about Sandridge, it was truly hated. There were people that were talking about how it was going bankrupt. It was terrible. The people were awful. They cited different CEOs who hadn't been CEO for several different management teams and, you know, it had gone through bankruptcy in between. It sounded like when people had looked at it last and when I was talking about it. And, you know, I really, I like this sort of situation too. I think it's really. If people don't know about a company, that's a, a promising setup. If people hate a company and they hate it a lot for reasons that are no longer relevant, especially they hated the pre-bankruptcy team, pre-bankruptcy set of assets, pre-bankruptcy setup, and it went through bankruptcy and it's just, you know, they retained the name for whatever reason. Um, I think that's a really sort of promising starting point for a potentially high performing investment. And they also, they, they owned their own office building at one point. They were able to sell that and get a, a great amount of money out of it. I mean, they could have sold it if they had sold it before for even more, but, you know, they sold it during COVID and still got a lot of money out uh, from it. And I think, I think when you just look at what they've been able to accomplish and they've subsequently paid a $2 special dividend, they're paying um, roughly $1.60 a year as a $15 stock as a dividend while they're building net cash on their balance sheet, just sort of one of these like very easy sort of boring businesses that people still, I don't know if they hate it as much anymore, but they still don't like it. And so I'm still owning it because it's still very undervalued just on sort of conventional metrics, but also, you know, I don't, I don't really buy stocks to be able to generate a dividend or get paid a dividend, but when they start to pay them sometimes instantaneously and sometimes over time, you can end up seeing the stocks materially re-rate. And I think this is one of those situations where, you know, I think people just don't associate Sandridge with a stable production base, growing cash flow and a large dividend. And now that they're paying it, I think they're still sitting on something like $6 a share of net cash as a $15 stock while paying $1.60 a year as an ordinary dividend. And then um, they're also paying... Um, and that actually may be high. I think I think it might be lower. And again, it's just not really my uh, my focus. There may that may be you know ten cents a quarter as a ordinary dividend, and then potentially more as a special. I don't remember the exact metrics. They also have a buyback, but just it's one of those things where it's it was this very controversial stock. It's sort of gone to a situation where I think people just 
don't like it, but don't really think about it. And their production is essentially flat. They're growing their oil percentage, which is improving their margins and showing revenue growth, even though natural gas prices have been terrible and oil prices haven't been great either for the last year. Um, and so it's just one of those things, you know, would I go and, and buy a ton of it today at this current setup? I'm not sure. Probably I'd want to own it if I didn't own it, but um, I don't think it's it's quite as sexy as it was of an investment, let's say two years ago when people thought it was going bankrupt and the stock was way lower, but there's still this tremendous potential return just as people go from disliking it to liking it a little, to seeing it as a great sort of income source. And they have this big buyback approved. They have a dividend. I mean, I don't know. It seems like a, a nice place to just hold and be able to get paid a lot. And again, it's one of those things where when you think about small caps, there some of it is available through these sort of deep value frameworks. And some of it, people just don't care, don't want to do the work, um, may have a negative emotional affinity to something. And so you can own a really boring business that's going to pay you a lot of money and uh, own it at a really attractive valuation. And so it's sort of, it's fun to get to talk about a company at this stage where it's sort of harvest mode, but less me going and selling the stock and more just sitting on it, getting paid, um, getting, uh, you know, via dividend, get, getting the stock bought back and still, you know, at a very undemanding low valuation. So, you know, these things can work. And I guess just one one note on, on both Sandridge and uh, some of those others, there's, it's really hard to own a multi-bagger. And it's really hard, partly because there's a temptation to sell and go do other stuff with money. And I think part of how we've done well is just finding things like this that are performing, the company management's executing, and just holding it through the hated to, you know, re-rate to maybe even liked uh, spectrum. And as that happens, you can experience multiple re-rates in the stock. And so I think, I think it's just so, so tempting to say, ah, well, I'll go find the next, you know, hated thing. But, you know, if Sandwich has gone from, you know, I don't know, what was it, a dollar or two or something when we first talked about it to 15, but it was 30 in the middle. And maybe it goes to 45 or 60 over a number of years. I mean, it's not so bad to hold it from 15 to potentially 30 or 60 or whatever. And none of that's a specific price target or anything like that. Just sort of trying to convey the general idea um, and get paid along the way. I mean, it's not it's not so bad to do that. And I think um, I think people often are, are in a rush to get out and can miss a big portion of their return by just being patient and allowing this thing that's already working to just keep working, allowing a new sort of set of shareholders to filter in over time. And then you know, there's all kinds of extra stuff that you get with a company like Sandridge, where they have a big tax shield and other sorts of aspects where they're sitting on an enormous amount of lithium brine, it turns out. The Mississippi lime produces a lot of water. And there's lithium that comes out with the water and no one's figured out how to extract it profitably yet. But hey, you know, it's the one of the largest concentrations of lithium brine in the country. And, um, you know, you get that for free while you're getting this dividend and while you're just waiting on them to buy back stock and uh, grow their oil production. So, um, you know, it's it's fun again to get to talk about this sort of thing at this stage and you just get a, I mean, I get to hold it and get paid while they figure all this stuff out and uh, while they get to shield their taxes. I mean, it's, uh, I think their NOL is something like $1.7 or $1.6 billion versus a $550 or so million dollar market cap. So um, we got a while to go before they, they burn through that. Absolutely. All right. Well, Josh, thank you so much for giving us the, you know, a look at a couple ideas that kind of fit what you're seeing right now. And, and to kind of close this out, because we're, we're pretty much about there, you know, again, looking kind of big picture at the small micro cap space, you know, in the near term, because some people might think, all right, am I going to miss my chance to actually, you know, pick up some of these more interesting maybe some special situations, some not, you know, do I have time to find some of these smaller micro cap oil and gas names that are trading at valuations that are, you know, significantly lower than they were previously, uh, or might things start turn around to turn around sooner rather than later? You know, what, what do you think about that? 
yeah, my uh, ability to predict the short term is a proven uh, a proven failure. So I'm I'm certainly not not the right person to to answer that. I would just say, look, I think when stocks are really cheap, it can be wonderful to own them, and it can also be emotionally uh, challenging and you know financially frustrating for long periods of time. And so I think I think it always makes sense to do diligence on investments, and always makes sense to carefully consider them because there's always a chance and in many cases it's a, a high likelihood of losing money before you make money on them on getting sort of little things wrong including market direction and potential stock market crashes or commodity crashes or whatever there's always a lot of risk and uncertainty in stocks and in commodities and especially in small cap commodity linked stocks so i don't know i would uh I, I don't know when these things will play out whether it's going to be next week or next year or three years from now but what i do know is that it makes a lot of sense for people to be very deliberate and to to know what they own rather than trying to rush in out of some fear that something's going to play out tomorrow and look like there there aren't any called strikes right like you you can you can miss something and learn a lot from missing it and i think the the last thing i would encourage people to do would be to rush into stuff just because they're worried that you know opec cuts may play out and oil prices may spike I mean, it might happen and you know, there's reasons to think that might happen, but it doesn't mean that one should rush into a, a, especially a small cap equity investment. Very good. All right. I think we're there. Josh, where can our audience go and find more information on Bison Interest and to follow you on social media? Yeah. So um, bisoninterest.com, we have a, a newsletter we send out stuff about once a month on, and then um, Bison Interest on Twitter and I think LinkedIn too. And then I'm on Twitter as well. If you look up Josh Young, you can find me. Are you, are you on threads yet? I mean, come on. You gotta, you gotta get the threads account. Yeah. I like the, uh, I'm going to do a terrible job saying this, but the, you know, the joke is that we talk about how we're worried that Mark Zuckerberg is going to, going to hear this and, uh, you laugh and I laugh and, uh, you know, Siri laughs and Alexa laughs. <laughs> So, you know, I <laughs> yeah. think uh, it's not that Twitter is private, right? It's it's very, very public. But I think I think I have some issues with the privacy arrangements around a number of different uh, technologies. And, you know, on one hand, one can just ignore it entirely. On the other hand, one can focus their efforts on places where um, there's already sort of proven audiences. And, you know, my my goal isn't to hit to reach everyone, my goal is to uh, you know provide hopefully valuable content, and if people are interested, they can find me. Fair enough. I was just asking if you had a Threads account, okay? Like, all right. No, I'm just, I'm just about it. Josh, really appreciate it, man. Thank you again as always, and I uh, look forward to having another chat soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thank you. Podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Yes.